All right, we're going to start an expository study in the book of Titus. I've been wanting to do this for a while, wanted to put this thing together, and uh, so now's the time. Now, normally I like to do my expository studies outdoors, but it's still very cold out there. It's really windy outside right now, and uh, where the ministry headquarters is at, there's not a whole lot of natural areas in the area here, so uh, just going to have to be indoors here by the old uh, yellow wall here for a little bit longer. I actually had one of my viewers suggest that uh, I turn this into a Camtasia, a green screen here so I can do Camtasia type work with it where uh, if you don't know what that means, it means that I can project images onto this through the computer video editing software. Um, very similar to what they do with the, the um, weatherman and stuff like that and news reporting. And that's eventually what this is going to be. This is going to be a green screen here. I have one. It's just uh, coming. And um, I apologize for the lighting. The lighting's not that great right now because I don't have my studio lights there again. Uh, that's in the U-Haul U-Boxes. Uh, quick update there. Um, we are actually going to be getting another truck, a Penske truck, that we will unload the U-Boxes at the facility and then load them into the truck, bring it here, unload the truck, take the truck back. It's going to be a whole lot cheaper than trying to get the U-Boxes delivered here. So, real good answer to prayer there. We weren't really sure what to do, trying a lot of different options, calling people here locally and things, and, and uh, that's how it worked out. So uh, praise the Lord for answered prayer. Um, we also have been able to get a dumpster uh, because this ministry headquarters, there's a lot of junk that was left here, um, and so we're able to throw a lot of things out. So Lord's been real good to us last week here, and... Uh, we praise the Lord. We're still moving forward. We still have a lot of work to do on the headquarters here. And then, of course, once spring comes, we'll be working on our property. So thank you to everybody who's been praying. And uh, please keep praying because we certainly need it. Okay, Titus chapter 1. This is a neat little book in your Bible. A lot of good things in this book of the Bible here, and particularly so in, in chapter 1. Okay, it says here, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. You'll notice that word appears a whole lot of times in the King James Bible. The truth. A definitive article, the, in front of a singular word, truth, means one. Okay? If I say a shirt, that can mean anything. If I say the shirts, plural, that can mean more than one. But if I say the shirt that I'm wearing, that can only mean one. Okay? As I'm referring to the outer shirt here. Of course, I have an undershirt on there. But the point is, when you say the truth, that means it's exclusive. All right, there's not multiple truths depending on how you feel. Okay, um, there's only one truth. All right, very important to get that. Now, our next verse here, we're going to see one of the central key truths in the entire Bible. All right, this is, this is one of the most important aspects of God. If this aspect of Him wasn't true, then He'd probably be Satan. Let's see about this. Verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So you see a couple things there. First of all, we have a hope of eternal life. Do we have eternal life right now in the sense of being immortal? No. We have the promise of eternal life. And who made that promise to us? A liar? Uh, somebody who goes back on their word? No. God the Father made us a promise and he put it in writing. King James Bible. Very interesting. God promised something and God cannot lie. And we're going to see why that is. John chapter 14, verse 6. And uh, I know some of you, if you're more seasoned in the Bible, you know the Bible well, you're probably going, you always go to this verse, Brian. Well, you have to keep in mind that there are people that just recently got saved that are watching these videos, and some of these verses might be new to them. I know I go over them a lot, but it's important to reinforce these truths for those of us that have been saved for a while. And for the new believer, it's important to get grounded in the things of the Lord. 
John chapter 14, verse 6. Remember the thing about truth. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Notice Jesus does not say, I have some aspects of truth. I, I believe truth. I teach truth. He says, I am the truth. Jesus Christ is truth personified. Very interesting. John chapter 8. You say, well, if, uh, if Jesus Christ is truth personified, then, then who would be lies personified? Because you have either truth or error. I didn't mean to hold up the Bible. You have truth or error. I'll say it that way. Okay? So who would be associated with error? John chapter 8, verse 43 through 47. Jesus speaking here, he says, Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Who is the manifestation of truth? Jesus Christ. Does the devil have any of Jesus Christ in him? No. But interestingly, he tries to counterfeit Jesus Christ. Hmm. That's an important aspect of the devil that you need to understand. The devil is not the opposite in terms of what we would think of as the opposite of Jesus Christ because you think of black and white as being opposites. No, the fact of the matter is Jesus Christ is represented as a rider on a white horse in Revelation 19. The Antichrist, which is Satan manifest in the flesh essentially, the Antichrist shows up on a white horse in Revelation chapter 6. Satan will counterfeit whatever the Lord Jesus Christ does. But he does not speak the truth. We're going to see that as we continue. Verse 44, When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. If you run into somebody that doesn't want any, anything to do with God's word and they don't they reject, don't even talk to me about that, I don't even want to hear it, that person is a child of the devil. All right? A child of disobedience, a child of wrath, the Bible calls them that. All right? They're in a very bad position. Very bad. But you can see there, Satan is the father of lies. Now, when was the very first time that Satan lied? In the Bible. Turn back in your Bible to Genesis. The first recorded lie that ever happened. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And you're going to see something very interesting. That Satan lies and he causes Eve to lie. Satan's lies, being he being the father of lies, he leads people into those same lies. See, it's not just enough for Satan to go around and lie and just be a liar for whatever, you know, he's actually trying to pull other people into this system of lies. And he does a very good job at that, by the way. Had a lot of, couple thousand years of practice here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. God never said that, by the way, if you study this. Lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Uh-oh, he just lied to her. See, first he questioned God's word up there in verse 1. Yea, hath God said. Did God really mean this? See, that wasn't really a lie. It was just he's questioning. He's putting doubt into Eve's mind. But then it goes down here in verse 4, and he lies to her. Very serious. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Question. Were, were, when they, she ate of this fruit and everything, were her eyes opened? Mm -hmm. You see, before that, she only knew good. She was innocent. Her and Adam both were innocent. So, you see, Satan will mix a little bit of truth with lies. But you see, then it's not the truth. 
See, the truth is something that has no mixture of error in it. That's very important to understand. When you put a little bit of lies in it, it's no longer truth. It's twisted. It's, it's, a, it's deceit. Deceit is not just all lies. It's truth mixed with lies. Right? In the same way, if you have a glass of water and somebody says, here, would you like some water? You say, well, sure, I, I guess so. Let me put a drop of cyanide in. Just one drop. I mean, it's a 16-ounce glass of water. I mean, big deal. One drop of cyanide. Would you drink it? You say, well, no, of course not. See the whole point? It still has the characteristic of water. It still has the look of water, but it is not water. Why? Because a little tiny bit of error has been mixed in with it. A little bit of poison has mixed, been mixed in with it. Very important to understand that. And what the devil will do is he will give a lot of truth, but mix in just a little bit of lies, thereby canceling the truth. Now, is there another time when Satan lied? Go to Matthew chapter 4 in your New Testament. Matthew 4. I'm going to see an interesting story here. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says here, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. When did Satan come to Jesus? When Jesus was physically strong or weak? Weak. You try going with, you know, well, don't. But, uh, you, you know, if you would go for forty days and forty nights without, you know, eating anything, fasting that entire time, um, I don't think most of our bodies today could handle that, to be very honest with you. Uh, I think that they were a whole lot healthier back there in the first century. You know, See, I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe that man gets better. I believe that man gets worse. I believe that we have deteriorated substantially from the first century. I don't think people today can fast, truly fast like Jesus was doing here for 40 days. Unless you are in extremely good health which most people aren't. But the point is, Satan came and tried to tempt Jesus when Jesus was feeling weak. Did you know the devil will do that with you? You know the devil's favorite time to tempt you is when you are feeling weak, when things aren't going good, when you're sick, when you're down. Mm -hmm. But a uh, very interesting thing here, Look at verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But let me ask you a question. What would have been the sin in Jesus Christ turning the stones into bread? What would have been the sin in that? The sin would have been that he would have been, number one, giving into his flesh, saying, I'm hungry. I'm just going to go ahead and make these stones into bread. And he could have done it. You know, he was God. But you see, the other part of it, and the worst part of it, he would have basically been listening to Satan. Obeying Satan. That's why the, the Lord didn't do that. But notice there he said that man shall, not, or, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, is it good to be in good health physically and not spiritually? No. You have to balance those two things out. While it is important for you to eat physical food, it's also very important for you to eat spiritual food. You have to know the book. You see, because Satan will come after you when you're weak, and if you don't know the book, you're going to have problems. Very important to understand that. And uh, by the way, Jesus did not say, I'll say this too, I was looking at my notes here, another point I wanted to make before we go on. Jesus did not say, um, now, my opinion is, Satan, he said, it is written. Jesus Christ quoted scripture. Hmm. Verse 5 and 6. Then the devil taketh him up into, an, into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, 
lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Wait a second. The devil quoted scripture. Oh, no, no. The, the devil wouldn't quote scripture because the devil's just 100% evil and, and he just, you know, he's into drugs and fornication and, and you know, drunkenness. And, but he would certainly never quote scripture. Oh, uh, yes, he would. He's a spiritual being. Yes, he would quote scripture. And yes, he did right there. But let me show you something interesting about this. Keep your hand there in Matthew chapter 4. And with your other hand, go back to Psalm 91. We're going to look and we're going to see what passage of scripture Satan was uh, quoting. Remember what I said earlier? Satan is the father of lies. That's what the Bible says, actually. And, and I said that Satan will give you a little bit of truth. Or a lot of truth, actually, with a little bit of error mixed in. Psalm 91, verse 11 through 12. Okay, it says here, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Here in Matthew chapter 4, uh, says here in verse 6, And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. What happened there? It says here, to keep thee in all thy ways. The actual passage there that Satan was saying, it's written. What did Satan do? He subtracted from the word of God. He didn't quote it all. So when Satan or his ministers start to quote scripture, you better be following along. You say, you know, I get all these people, you're Denlinger's a Jesuit, Brian Denlinger's a Jesuit. Oh. Okay, well, there's one way that you can find that out. When I'm reading to you from the Bible, you better be following along. And if what I'm saying is lining up here, then you can just laugh at these people and, oh, they're crazy, you know, saying that Brian's actually a Jesuit. Give me a break. But if I'm quoting things and I'm saying it says this and it says something totally different, and I'm making my point based on the way I'm changing it, yeah, that's a problem. That's a big problem. You see, you need to know the book. That spirit of truth has to be there in you, guiding you into all truth. don't want to get ahead of myself here. Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. What's Jesus' answer to him? Jesus said unto him, It is written again. He uses the Bible again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I actually read some some warped, you know, lunatic. This guy, he's in he's in the ministry, and he wrote this book, uh, like a devotional book. And I was reading it, some of my research, and um, he actually said that here Jesus was actually tempted to take Satan's offer. That is not at all what's going on there. Jesus Christ was not tempted. I mean, you think that you know what happens here? He. Uh, Verse 5, that will take him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And um, basically is saying, cast yourself down, you know, and we'll see what happens, kind of a deal. And, you know, what? why does he say, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God? Well, very simple. Because the temptation there of the Lord was not, hey, I'm going to fall down and worship you. Hey, I'm going to bow to you. I'm going to do your what you're telling me to do. That wasn't the temptation. The temptation was, I can destroy you before the time. Don't tempt me. You know, because the Bible, you know, spells out very plainly what's going to happen to Satan in the future. Now, you know, that was revealed and stuff later on, but I believe that the Lord knew that. The Lord knew the doom that's going to happen to Satan. So he's saying, don't tempt me, because I can destroy you right now. <laughs> Verse 8 through 11. Let's read these verses here. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Three times Jesus quotes scripture. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Kind of interesting because the angels actually come and minister to Jesus, which was what Satan left out there, you know. 
you know, to keep thee in all thy ways. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what they came and did, you know. And Satan had left that part out. Kind of interesting. But you see the thing there. The devil offers kingdoms to people that will fall down and worship him. Now, I'm sure that God manifest in the flesh was just so impressed with the kingdoms of this world. I mean, he probably thought, boy, I'm really tempted to give things up here. I mean, <laughs> what a stupid thing for Satan to say to God manifest in the flesh. I mean, give me a break. But you know, Satan makes this same offer today. And there's a lot of people that fall down and worship the devil. I mean, you know, there's, there's videos out there. You have uh, Katy Perry and she said, I tried to serve God for a while and, and that didn't work, so I decided to serve Satan. You had uh, Bob Dylan. There's videos of him here on YouTube and he's being interviewed by 60 Minutes or something, I think. And he says about how he made a deal with, with uh, the chief commander or something, I think he said. Chief commander years and years ago when he was a young man so he could be successful. I mean, th these Hollywood celebrities and music you know, rock singers and stuff like this, they have actually come out and admitted that they're making deals with Satan. Why? Same thing he was trying to do with Jesus Christ right there. But you know what's interesting? Satan is who? The father of lies. What he is offering people there, he makes it sound really good, doesn't he? You know? All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. But he doesn't tell them the truth. See? I mean, Jesus Christ could see right through it. He knew. He's God manifest in the flesh. But these foolish Hollywood celebrities and all the businessmen, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call them, all these big shots out there, Satan offers that same thing to them, but he doesn't tell them the whole truth. You see, what is the whole truth about this world? It's never going to satisfy you. See, he offers them fame, fortune, all this stuff, but he doesn't tell them the whole truth about it. You see, these people come to Satan wanting to be successful in life so that they can find happiness. And the devil is never going to come to them and say, you know what, I'm going to give you all this stuff, but honestly, i got to tell you, you're probably going to end up committing suicide or having to do drugs a lot and stuff because really this stuff isn't going to make you happy. See, the devil's never going to tell them that. The devil's never going to tell them, hey, this stuff is miserable. It can't bring you joy. The Bible says there's no peace to the wicked. The devil's never going to tell them that. So again, you see, Satan is the father of lies. But now let's go back to Titus. We're going to be going to a lot of different places in Scripture today, so... I normally would say just keep your hand there in Titus, but we're going to be doing a lot of flipping. Titus chapter 1, verse 3. Okay, it says, But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, God our Savior. Okay, God was manifest in the flesh. Right, you read about that over there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. So you have God being manifest in the flesh. But that was for the people back in the first century. You can't see Jesus Christ walking around on the earth today. All right? But you can see his word. You say, well, what, what do you mean by his word? Well, let's go to John chapter 1. I'm going to show you an interesting comparison here. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. It says here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jump down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay? 
Now I want you to notice a very important distinction. I've talked about this in other videos, but I'll repeat it one more time. Whenever you see a capital W word, okay, in other words, the word, word, <laughs> with a capital W at the beginning, that is talking about Jesus Christ, the manifest word, right? Whenever you see the word with a lowercase w, w-o-r-d, that is talking about the written word or spoken word other times. You'll see that too. But what you have here is in your King James Bible, you have seven references to the capital W word of God seven times. Interesting, I have a video out there if you uh, look, do a search on it, you know, on my channel, or search for it rather on my channel, uh, talks about how that the NIV has removed one of those references. So you don't have seven references to the word, only six. And then there are two other uh, words, I can't remember what they are right now. I think the priest after the order of Melchizedek, and then there's something else too. And the NIV, both in both cases, the King James Bible says, has seven references. The NIV removes one each. So King James, three different unique titles for Jesus Christ. It's seven references, seven references, seven references. NIV removes one of each of those, so you have 666. Six, six. That's just a coincidence, though, I'm sure. Uh-huh. But let me ask you a question. Do you have a physical connection to Jesus Christ on this earth? Physical. I didn't say spiritual. I didn't say prayer and, and the witness of the Holy Ghost and all that. I'm not talking about that. Do you have a physical connection to Jesus Christ on the earth? Yes, you do. So what is it? This? He said, oh, come on now. Bibliolatry, bibliolatry. Uh, no, I'm going to show you why I say that. Jesus Christ was the manifest Word of God, capital W, all right? And He equals absolute truth. John 14, 6, as we read earlier, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Turn to John, John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 37. This is an interesting thing here too. John chapter 18, verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You see the standard Jesus just set there? He's saying if you're saved, if you're one of my children, you'll hear my voice. Why? Because the spirit of truth is in you. Right? Now watch how Pilate just uh, basically exposes himself as being a lost hellbound sinner. Watch this. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? Isn't that funny? Jesus got, just got done saying, anybody who's of me who knows the truth, they'll believe in me. They'll hear my voice. Why? It's the truth. Absolute truth. Pilate says, what is truth? That's what anybody who rejects absolute truth says. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. You want a good backup definition for absolute truth? Right there it is. I find in him no fault at all at all. Do you find fault in this book? You say, yes, I don't believe it's a good translation. Okay, then you're not a Bible-believing Christian. In fact, you know, these people, I don't believe that there is a perfect translation out there. Okay, how do you know you're saved? Well, I feel I'm saved. I believe I'm saved. I believe I've put my faith in Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ who? Who's Jesus Christ? I mean, hey, if this book has errors in it, then how can you trust the parts where it talks about salvation? How can you trust the part where it talks about, you know, Jesus Christ? Maybe those parts have been mistranslated. You see the problem? See? That's a big problem. What about the written word of God? Is the written word absolute truth? John 17, verse 17. You ought to know this one by now, too. 
Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word, lowercase w, word is truth. Does it say thy word is a source of truth? Thy word contains some truth? No, it's thy word is truth. Absolute truth. Jesus Christ is absolute truth. The word of God is absolute truth. The written word. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7 says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Interesting, because we just read back there in Titus about God has manifested His Word through preaching. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. Hmm. You reckon there's a tie in there? Oh, yeah. What about the manifest Word of God? It's sinless and pure. Jesus Christ was sinless and pure. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Every temptation that you've ever had to sin, Jesus went through the same thing when he was here on the earth. Every single one of them. It says it right there in the text. Yet, he was without sin. Jesus came through. He was perfect. He was pure. He was sinless. Now, do we have anything physical on this planet that's like that? You say, Brian Denlinger, <laughs> are you kidding me? I'm not perfect. I'm not pure. I'm not sinless. I'm purified by the blood, I'm washed in the blood, my sins are taken away, sure, but I still have sin within me. Just as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Absolutely. All right. What is the physical thing that we have on this earth that is pure and sinless and perfect? The written word. Jesus Christ is the manifest word. Here we have the written word. All right. Psalm 119, verse 140 says, Thy word, lowercase w, is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Aren't we supposed to love Jesus Christ? Yeah. Then why would it be written back there in the book of Psalms that we're to love the written word? How can we love two different things? Well, because they're the same. These two different things are the same. Now, I realize that my King James Bible was never nailed to a cross, it was never buried, it never rose again the third day. I understand that, okay? But what I'm saying is, this title, The Word of God, Jesus was the manifest Word. He's the one that died on the cross. But this is the record, all right? And don't tell me that you can be saved and believe in Jesus Christ and deny the record that God gave of His dear Son. Don't tell me about it. All right, what about the manifest Word of God? He can grow and be multiplied. Acts 2 verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That doesn't mean that they were adding wings onto a building, okay? Or, you know, lobbies and, you know, uh, bleachers or something. No, that's not what it's talking about. The church is a living body of believers. You better understand that one too. And uh, Colossians 1.24, just to reinforce this, it says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in, in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The body of Jesus Christ is his church. That is the word church. And as I've said in many studies before, you have people that go to a building someplace, and they're lost, and they think that they're in church, and they're not in the true church of Jesus Christ. But you see, it's interesting because the manifest Word of God grows. Every new believer that, that gets saved, you have Jesus Christ, a capital W, His body is growing and getting bigger. Okay, But what about the written Word of God? Is it possible that the written Word of God can grow and be multiplied? Acts 19, verse 20 says, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Lowercase w. Did you know what the best-selling book of all time is? I'll give you a hint. 
I don't know if you can even see it here on this thing. King James Version. The King James Version. Right there. Best-selling book of all time. What's going on? So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. This Bible, in spite of over 400 years now, no one's been able to, able to overtake this book. And they claim that the NIV is the most read, most trusted, best-selling, and all this other stuff. Yeah, but look what they have to do to sell the thing. It's a rotten piece of junk. They always have to come out with new editions and study this and this women's devotional Bible and teenage extreme youth Bible and all this stuff. They can't just market it as just a standard black leather with the gold gilt edge. They can't do that. They would never be able to compete with God's book. That's why they have to come out with all kinds of editions and archy looking covers and whatever else. And they're constantly revising it. 1974, 1984, 19... 91 or something like that, I think. 2001, you know, with the TNIV, and 2005 with the TNIV whole Bible, and then 2011 with the newest NIV, and they'll revise it again another couple years. Why? Because it's dead. That's why they have to continually revive the thing. This thing here, this King James, has, has remained constant since 1769. And the only reason it was different before that was because the English language itself wasn't even standardized. A lot of the spellings of English words weren't standardized. So, you can watch my video 1769 or 1611 if you want more on that. But you see, it's very important to understand that the only real physical thing that you have on this earth that connects you to God the Father is right here. King James Bible. Now, what about the manifest word? Going back to Jesus Christ. Could Jesus Christ predict the future? Matthew chapter 21, 24, excuse me, verses 1 through 4 says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Did it happen? Was Jerusalem destroyed? Was the temple destroyed? Yep. Absolutely. Jesus prophesied a future event. And it happened. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Do we live in deceptive times right now? Slightly. Okay. <laughs> um, you, can, you are being deceived nonstop. A lot of times we don't even realize it. Don't even realize how bad it is. Even if you don't watch television, which you better not watch television, okay? If you're watching television, repent, all right? Get away from that thing. That thing is mind control on a very serious level. And I keep saying, you know, I need to come out with a study on it. Uh, and eventually uh, it's going to be a tough one to do because there's going to be a lot of copyright stuff there because I'm going to have to use videos to prove what's going on. But we'll see. But television's really, really bad. I mean, you're being deceived on levels that you can't even... It's going right past the conscious mind into the subconscious. I mean, subliminal messages and just crazy. But even if you don't watch television, you're being deceived when you go to the, the stores. You go to the grocery store. Look at anything in there. It's got toxic waste in it. You say, like what? High fructose corn syrup, aspartame, monosodium glutamate. Uh, cellulose, it's got all this, these toxic additives, you know, uh, what hydrogenated vegetable oils and stuff like this. I mean, we're talking stuff that's banned in other countries. What's going on? You're being deceived. You buy this food, it's a, you know, healthy, you know, uh, health, uh, health benefits, you know, special food to make you healthy, low fat, your diet food and stuff like this. They're like diet soft drinks, you know. They're toxic. They are like really, really, really bad. You'd better be better off drinking regular soda or pop, whatever you want to call it. I mean, you, diet sodas are very, very, very bad. But you see, what do they do? They label it to make you think that you're going to be healthier if you drink it. And a lot of the health food out there and stuff like that. I mean, again, watch the sermon, The Sin of Gluttony and How to Fight It. I mean, I talk about some of the food additives. It's bad. Why? What's going on? Well, you see, back there, almost 2,000 years ago, 
a man named Jesus Christ, the manifest word of God, prophesied that there would be deception in the last days. And by the way, read the rest of the book of Matthew chapter 24 sometime, because that deception thing was just the beginning of what Jesus Christ prophesied. And his prophecies have come true and true and true. He prophesied the rebirth of the nation of Israel in their own country with their own government. It wasn't even there when he was on the earth. The nation of Israel was under Roman control. They didn't have their own government. And Jesus Christ, there in Matthew chapter 24, prophesied that Israel would eventually be reborn as a nation. And that generation would not pass away till all things are fulfilled. Guess what? Israel's a nation. So some guy, some Jew, almost 2,000 years ago, said what was going to happen, and here it is. That's just a coincidence, though. <laughs> yeah. How about the written Word of God? Can the written Word of God, we know that Jesus Christ, the manifest Word of God, but can the written Word of God prophesy futuristic events? Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. We're actually going to go there. I want you to see this one. Galatians 3, 8. Okay, it says here, And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And thee shall all nations be blessed. That's a very interesting verse. You say, why is that? There weren't any written scriptures when Abraham was around. It wasn't revealed until Moses. Later on, God gave Moses the first five books of your Bible. Well, then how could the scripture have been there to preach? But it was. Interesting. And, of course, if you know Bible prophecy, you understand that the written Word of God contains many hundreds, probably thousands of Bible prophecies concerning the future. And guess what? They're all coming to pass. Every single one of them. And I'm going to be glad, I am I should say I'm very glad, that I'm not going to be here for a lot of these scriptures to become true, you know, to be fulfilled. Mostly in the book of Revelation, if you know what I mean. What about the manifest Word? Was he, uh, another interesting point, the manifest word was heard and received by the common people, the common man. Mark chapter 12, verse 37 says, David therefore himself called him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. So it was the common people that came and were listening to Jesus Christ. How about the written word? What's the main crowd that accepts this book, this King James Bible? The educated scholars, the PhDs, the THDs, the THMs, the priests, the popes, the archbishops, the cardinals. Uh-uh. Acts 28, verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. The simple people. Not the Jewish chosen people there in the book of Acts. A lot of them were rejecting Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So they started to preach to the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to, bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So who did God choose? Who does God choose, I should say? To hear the book, common people. It says there, foolish things, weak things, base things, things which, are, things which are despised. Sounds like common people. That doesn't sound like the upper crust of society, because it isn't. The manifest word can save the sinner. Jesus Christ can save the sinner. Acts 16, verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Very familiar passage. What about the manifest word? What about this book? Romans 10 verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
lowercase w, word of God. James 1.21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Hmm. Interesting. The fact of the matter is, this King James Bible is the closest thing on earth that you have to Jesus Christ. There's no man out there that's going to be able to fill in the place of Jesus Christ. Nobody out there like that. Nobody's that perfect. Nobody's there without sin. But you have a book, a guidebook to take you through life that you can check ministries out with. Okay? So what had you better do with this book? You better believe it, but you also better defend it. Interesting here, two verses. Mark chapter 8, verse 38 says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words, words, hello, words, lowercase w again, written words, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Luke chapter 9, verse 26 says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. And it's interesting because what is the modern Bible version movement all about? The King James is too archaic. We can't understand it. It's not for this time. We need to update it. What well, you mean you're uh, ashamed of the Old English? The scriptural English, by the way? This is the way it's supposed to be written right here. It wasn't that they, you know, used Elizabethan English or something like that to make the Bible sound neat. That wasn't it. This is proper translation. You have a difference between thee, thou, thine, thy, and ye and you. Study that issue if you want to. Okay? This is the way it's supposed to be translated right here. And I mean, shouldn't we want to give God our very best? Wouldn't we want God to have the highest form of the English language that's ever been? Why bring it down to the street level? Well, because then you don't have to be ashamed of the word. Then it sounds just like everybody's common speech. See? It's not supposed to be that way. Let's go back to Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 4. 